Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Lapine. I'm a partner in Thompson Hines Business Restructuring Group. And along with David Watson, who is one of our panelists for today, we co-chair Thompson Hines Distressed M&A Initiative. We certainly want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Our presentation is, in fact, on distressed M&A investing and what we can expect in 2021. As you just heard, we are recording today's session. So to the extent that you'd like to rewatch today's presentation, we will be happy to send you a link after we finish up things today. I guess from a recording perspective, we can, we can all chronicle how well we were able to prognosticate things for, for 2021. We have close to 100 people on today's call, so we're going to try and make this as interactive as possible. Uh, our colleague Matt Kirshner is in the chat room monitoring things. So to the extent that you have any questions or comments or, or discussion points that you'd like us to focus on during today's session, uh, feel free to utilize your, your chat icon, which is in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, and we will try to get to as many uh, questions and comments that you may have during today's presentation. Let me go ahead and introduce our panelists uh, for today's session. First up, Jim Gansman of Rock Creek Advisors. Jim is the founder of Rock Creek, which is a financial advisory services firm that is uh, focused in the middle market. Uh, Jim's group focuses on uh, representing uh, creditors committees and debtors and trustees in uh, bankruptcies, as well as specializing as asset needs and assignments for the benefit of creditors. And of course, when there is a sale process involved, Jim's group will uh, certainly wear the invest in investment banking hat uh, so that they can implement those sale processes. Let me also introduce you to the aforementioned David Watson. David is a partner in Thompson Hines Corporate Practice Group. David uh, specializes in distressed M&A uh, activity, and he's going to be providing us his perspective from the corporate side of things in terms of what he expects in 2021. But before we get to 2021, I think it makes sense to take a look back at 2020, see how it essentially calibrates things for, for this upcoming year. And what we saw in 2020 was certainly a roller coaster type year, as we all know, given the, the pandemic. I'm sure many of you are, are nodding in January and February. I think we all expected a very robust year that was gonna be consistent throughout. Uh, profitability seemingly was up, businesses were doing well, and there just seemed to be a, a whole lot of activity uh, uh, on, an, on the horizon uh, in 2020. Then obviously the pandemic hit in the third week of March. We essentially went on a, uh, a three month timeout where we saw a great deal of deal activity stop or uh, slow down and stop altogether. As you can see from the statistics, uh, deal activity was down close to 30% uh, from and comparing 2020 to 2019. But at the same time, once we got through that three month timeout uh, from July through the end of the year, uh, we saw a, a good deal of activity and there were certain industries that essentially benefited to some degree from the, from the pandemic. And that allows me to segue over to David Watson first. David, obviously you had activity going on in 2020 and I'd like you to pinpoint some of the areas where you saw uh, some robust uh, activity during the, the pandemic and primarily, frankly, those last six months of the year. Sure, Scott, I'm happy to do that. The, the last six months actually were quite busy. The, the last quarter, uh, very busy and December busier still. And in fact, we closed, uh, my group closed four transactions the last four business days of the year. So we, we ended with a lot of activity. The thing that I think characterized the M&A I saw was much of it was actually healthy company M&A, uh, transactions involving those companies that really did well out of COVID. The two that stand out for me were consumer products companies, which had a, a strong online presence, uh, both of whom were sold to uh, public companies that wanted to take advantage of uh, the, the growth and the health of those, of those smaller companies. And I think both of whom were motivated to sell by the, the changing tax law that I think we expect uh, with the new administration. So. That was actually surprising to me, the, the percentage of the business that I saw that was healthy M&A as opposed to distressed. Jim, what did you see in 2020 and what, what kept you primarily uh, quite busy over the course? Well, of I, I, I think in a lot of people here, you know, have, have, you know, read about this and, and everything, like that, but I think it really played out 
where you had um, such a dichotomy, where you had businesses, as David as David said, that really thrived in the pandemic, and they they were able to um, change their model, um, get their supply chain in order, and uh, and and move forward, and, and really were successful. Um, and then there were those industries that were just completely decimated um, by the pandemic. Uh, you know, so whether that was oil and gas, whether that was um, retail, whether that was restaurants, uh, you saw industry sectors, no matter if you were the strongest balance sheet going in or, or, or the weakest, um, your chance of survival were, were greatly diminished. Um, I think what we did see was a lot of latitude from um, banks and financial institutions to try to see to the other side, which sort of makes um, 2021 that much more challenging as you know, people have had issues now for almost a year. And you bring up a good point. And one of the things that we also saw in 2020 was that our traditional lenders, as we, as we can proceed to the next slide, but it, traditional lenders were uh, really trying to take care of their existing borrowers, uh, not really making new loans and showing a great deal of deference to their, to their borrowers by forbearing for an extended period. What we did see was a lot of dry powder. And I think that that's a, uh, an important concept that you know, we're going to continue to see uh, for the foreseeable future. But in that dry powder, direct lending and special purpose acquisition companies and, and so forth played a, a huge role, I think, in salvaging uh, 2020. And that, that allows us, I think, to segue uh, into 2021 a little bit as we move to the next slide and the catalysts that are going to drive activity. Uh, wanted to ask your thoughts, guys. Uh, David, feel free to start in terms of what you feel are the uh, significant catalysts that are gonna drive activity in 2021. Sure, um, I think one will be the end of government support. I think the PPP loan, there have been a lot of things said about it, not all of them complimentary, but for a number of the companies that I work with, that was a lifesaver. The second round of PPP is gonna be more narrowly targeted and it's gonna be available to fewer borrowers. And I think when, when those things run out, uh, that's gonna be the witching hour for a lot of people. I think another thing that'll be important <clears throat> is I think everybody's trying to figure out when the economy, for those people who are suffering, when the economy is going to restart. Because if you have a restaurant chain, it seems to me it's hard to have any confidence putting any capital into it if you don't know you're going to have diners. So uh, my personal metric for that is when when kids really start to go back to school, I think that'll be a big uh, canary, if you will, to, to tip off the fact that the economy is going to start up. And then I think perversely, that's when you'll actually see some of the distressed deals happen because lenders will be able to take action. Uh, with the hope that they won't actually wind up owning the assets, which I don't really think they want to do. Yeah, hey, David, let me let me just follow up on on what you said. Um, you know, in industry that we've spent a lot of time on in 21, um, that though I think there'll be a lot more time spent on in 22, is the restaurant industry, and and we worked on. Um, you know, a, a 30 million dollar loan that was in bankruptcy, a 40 store. Um, Midwestern uh, restaurant chain in 2021, and the only buyer that was at the table at a real number, there were there were you know guys who wanted to spend 20 cents on the dollar, um, was the lender. And just to sort of what you talked, I mean, if you look at the restaurant deals that got completed, that came out of Chapter 11 um, in um, in 2020 and did not convert to a Chapter 7. Um, I think to a T, every one of them was taken back by the by the banks. Um, so the so the banks are now sitting on things, riding out the the the, the pandemic. I mean, the, the nice thing about the deal that we worked on, PPP carried us through. We had the largest PPP loan um, when we went into bankruptcy. We had three hundred thousand dollars in cash besides, and we're able to come out the other side, save fifteen hundred jobs. Um, and, and so that's that's a good outcome for all the all the right reasons. Um, but I also think, you know, one of the things that's going to drive things, drive deals this year um, is just cheap money. Um, you know, the, 
there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal this week about how junk bonds, you know, trade at four percent basically. You know, triple C is is it you know is is it four percent? That's crazy. Um, you know, so people are refinancing out their debt at you know at 10, 12, 14 percent down to you know four to eight percent, which is you know going to give a lot of liquidity. But it's also just how much dry powder is there, um, whether it's in the form of a SPAC, whether it's in the form of private equity, or it's just or it's just lenders um, who are you know that that you know BDCs and, and alternative lenders who just need to put capital to work. Yeah, Jim, I think that's a really good point, and you, you talk about the the uh, the dry powder that's available. I think another catalyst along those same lines is. You know, and you mentioned the PPP money that uh, your restaurant client uh, was able to, to seize upon. When is the when is that money going to run out? Uh, we've obviously got stimulus in place, uh, presumably going to be in place over the next uh, month or so. But I think that's a really good catalyst to figure when will when will the music stop as it pertains to the stimulus money and propping up companies that presumably may not have a go forward strategy. Uh, that that's certainly something to monitor. And the, the other thing that I wanted to mention, you know, I, I, I recall Jimmy Carter in, in the, during the hostage crisis in the late seventies talking about a crisis in confidence. I think to a, to a degree, there's that same conf, a, a lack of confidence right now when you consider the fact that people are looking at the new normal and wondering what what's that uh, going to look like. So taking that into account and determining when people are going to to be comfortable going out again, going into restaurants, taking vacations. These are things that are going to have a huge role in terms of deal activity over the course of the, uh, of the next couple of months and years for certain. Let's, let's go ahead and, and move to uh, some of the things that, that Jim had just mentioned and talking about plentiful opportunities as we crystal ball things in 2021. Jim mentioned the, the cheap money. One of the other things that I wanted to ask Jim about, um, because it seems as if there's going to be a real windfall for the middle market. And I know, Jim, that we have talked about that in the past. Um, go ahead and give me your thoughts as to why you think it's such an advantageous time for the middle market to seize upon everything that we're all going through today. Well, if you, I, I think there's lots of reasons to, you know, um, if you sort of said, where's the sweet spot in distressed investing for, for 2021? Um, that the middle market is is the place because we, we talked about cheap cheap money. Cheap money is always going to be much more available uh, to large companies than middle market companies. It's it's always tougher for a middle market to to go out and get get cheap money. Um, so just you know for that that point alone that that gives it. Um, it's also that you know a lot of middle market companies are in somebody's supply chain that's been affected. So they're a part of the supply chain. I'll give you a couple of examples that we worked on in, um, in 2020. One was an aerospace company that made um, parts for helicopters. Um, there, they were you know, a very healthy business beforehand, but all of a sudden they had no customers because the supply chain um, to the Sikorskys and the Boeings of the world were completely shut down. So they were, you know, you, you wouldn't think a manufacturing company was out of business for a four month period, but they were. Um, we looked at a, a, a paint booth company, um, you know, at the, at the end of last year, uh, that I, again, if you just looked at sort of where they were, um, they were, they were in it because their German, you know, parent was in bankruptcy and they just didn't have enough pipeline in the U.S. Um, to sort of continue. You know, those are the, 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 the types of stories that you're going to continue to see um, in the middle market, you know, dealing with supply chain. Uh, we're working on a, a glass company now. Um, you know, so I think, you know, different than what we saw last year, we're starting to see some industrial companies um, have issues. Um, but again, you know, if you're making glass for office buildings, um, that business sort of dried up pretty quickly, you know, and so what do you do and how do you pivot? Um, so, you know, there is going to be a lots of hats and have nots, and there's going to be lots of opportunities for, you know, to buy, 
assets very cheaply this year, for especially for strategics. David, go ahead. Any thoughts? Sure, I'll add a few. I, I think uh, Jim's observation that the the larger, better capitalized companies have been hurt less. Uh, you know, the flip side of that is is what we're talking about is that the smaller, less well capitalized companies are the ones that are really going to struggle. I think that uh, one consequence of this the COVID shakeup is that there will be smaller companies for sale because in the case of a PE fund, uh, PE funds have a lot of money, but they also have limitations on their ability to put more money into existing investments. Sometimes it's a, uh, it's too late in the fund. Sometimes they have concentration issues. Sometimes they just have a practice that they don't do it. Uh, I think some of the bigger companies are going to be uh, trying to focus uh, use their capital in the places where they think they have the best opportunities. And the other side of focus is shedding things that are not your focus. So I think there'll be some divestitures that will be available. And then I think there will just be, you know, privately owned businesses where people have come to the end of the road. So for all of those reasons, once there gets to be a market again, uh, I think we will see a fair amount of activity in the middle market. Yeah, and I think you bring up a very good point in terms of once we see a market again, that allows uh, us to talk a little bit about, uh, from a timeline perspective, when we would see uh, significant deal flow. And, you know, I look at 2021, and uh, I, I think that it, it could very well compare to what 2020 looked like in that it may be a softer first quarter, but then deal activity continues to uh, to increase throughout the uh, the year, and by the third and fourth quarter, we're going to be looking at similar levels as to what we saw in 2020, recognizing that we're not going to have the three-month timeout, knock wood, that we had in, in 2020. I'm just wondering whether you sort of see things similar to that, and just sort of this train kind of continuing to pick up steam as we work our way through 21 and then on into 22 and so on. Uh, I'll I'll go first, and David, then maybe you can jump in. Um, I think the hardest thing for 2021 for people um, to figure out is, is when is the pandemic over? Um, so I literally was on the phone this morning with a, with a major venture capitalist who has a company that has been completely shredded, you know, basically went from 800 employees to 100 employees um, in one month. <clears throat> Because you know they because their business their business model did not work um, in um, you know in the pandemic and as he said and as you know as as we saw many a times they're now on their third bite of their apple with their with their landlords so they first got an immediate deferral last year um, because everybody thought oh we need three months to get through this every bank every uh every landlord was very willing to give concessions um we got brought into a case where we then took a second bite of the apple which was in july which said okay give us runway to the end of the year we'll take some rent concessions into the following year let's see what happens um got that done and then we get to january 1st and it's like uh oh when is this going to be over and now let's go back and say is our crystal ball, is it April, is it May, or is it July, or, or as, you know, President Biden said last night, it's December, um, when the new normal is. So I think, you know, those are the, those are the things that are really going to drive um, the M&A, you know, market, um, you know, 421, which is when people get comfortable that there's an outcome. Um, you know, saying that, though, there is just so much dry powder that's out there. Um, you know, people who have real diligence and sort of, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the multiples that are being paid today are multiples that we saw in 2007, 2008 in a market that's a very choppy market because there's haves and have nots. So it's, it's just quite interesting. Well, the, lo ahead, the longer I do this, the, uh, the more confident I am that there are a few things that I just simply don't know. And one of them is how to time the market. Um, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, at least from my point of view, I think when kids go back to schools and when the federal stimulus stops, I think those are two indications to me that society is beginning to go back to, back to work. And I think 
personally, that's when I think uh, everything else will start to move because people will then be able, even for the, the businesses that are currently have nots, there will be some uh, perception that you can go back to having a revenue stream and then there'll be buyers. That's a fair point. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide and uh, other direction. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, love, thank you, level setting the market. And this sort of gives you an idea of the carnage that we saw uh, in 2020 and right, frankly was leading up to this um, in terms of the impact on retail and the, the restaurant industry being uh, hit incredibly hard and the movie theater industry as well. Um, you know, the, the idea of what is, what is the new normal and getting back to a post COVID world we obviously are going to need to consider all of these things because it's certainly going to look a lot different. Um, certainly, as you look at retail, uh, the, the pandemic accelerated the pace of, of retail's decline. Um, and I, I would also note, as, as we look at some of the additional bullet points on the screen here, in terms of the commercial uh, space industry as well as uh, temporary office space, commercial real estate and temporary office space, the impact that the pandemic has had uh, currently and ultimately will have in the future is certainly quite significant and wondering what kind of plays that we will ultimately see uh, in 2021 and beyond. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the Wall Street Journal articles um, relating to cheap money being out there. There was also an article this past week talking about returning to office space um, because that can has been kicked down the road so many different times. You know, when we originally, when we all left our offices back in March of last year, uh, we thought we'd be out for two weeks, right? Maybe three weeks, and then we would return. Well, March became June, and June became September, and September became the new year. And there still is some debate as to when uh, offices will be reopened um, you know, significantly and people will be coming back down uh, to the office. So that's certainly something that uh, we're all going to have to figure out, and that's going to be on the part of commercial real estate to kind of navigate through. Now, I, I do want to underscore the temporary office space industry, which is really a fascinating one. And you look at what has transpired, um, you know, in the in the initial uh, craziness of the pandemic. The we certainly have seen several bankruptcies with. Notel and Regis, and uh, we're seeing WeWork essentially pivot away from uh, its current business model and focusing more on uh, it being a real estate company uh, through the uh, direction of Sandeep Pathrani, who obviously has experience at being a general growth and, and Brookfield, of course. Um, but it, it, it leads me to believe that we're going to see a lot more activity on the distress side with regard to the temporary office space. And Jim, that, that allows me to talk a little bit about uh, an assignment that you had uh, this past year uh, with regard to the serve core assignment for the benefit of creditors. Do you want to touch base on that? And, and, and frankly, that was a, an example of a liquidation. Um, and I would note that it's, it may be more likely that we see liquidations as opposed to restructurings in the temporary office space. And I wanted to get your comments on that as well. Yeah, and, and that, you know, I, I, I don't view that, that ServCorp was was a liquidation. Um, ServCorp is a you know, major competitor to Regis on a, on a global basis, um, a public company who looked at their U.S. footprint and sort of said, our U.S. footprint is, is too big. Um, and so they, they came to us through their, their law firm um, and we worked on an assignment for benefit of creditors. So what's really interesting is we were doing it at the same time that Regis was doing it. We probably did about the same amount of centers as Regis did. And Regis was a very public uh, process and, uh, and ServCorp. I don't think anybody ever knew it, knew what was going on, except um, the company, uh, the us as a, as a signee and, and the landlord. And then the, 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 the tenants who, um, you know, they tried to uh, put in other centers. So if they had three centers in LA, they, you know, went from three to one, or, you know, they had eight centers in New York, they went from eight to eight to five kind of thing, um, you know, and, and really to fight to, to the next day. Um, I think, 
you know, I think that the, the temporary office space is a really interesting thing. I think that the, the real spot that has huge issues um, in the market that we have not seen a great amount of bankruptcies uh, or distressed um, yet is um, in the hospitality space, so hotels and then commercial office space. Um, and I think that is where you know people have really gotten forbearances from from their banks. Um, I think the the hard part about it is is that you know banks now have stress on on their loan portfolio. So um, if you're a tenant who's not paying, you know, in an office building in, in Cleveland, you got to go deal with the landlord, but the landlord's got to go deal with his bank. Um, and the same thing if you know if you're you know if you own three you know three days in. Uh, you know, on in South Carolina on I-95, what do you do here? We're starting to see that, but I think that's where, you know, the, the if you said what industry is going to get hit the most, the earliest in 2021, I think it's going to be hospitality. And then I think, you know, as the, as the year goes on, it's going to be the, the, um, you know, the office space, the, 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 the large, uh, you know, the real estate firms and just how leveraged they are. About 18 months ago, one of our partners wrote an internal memo where he talked about the real estate market as being a Ricky Bobby market, by which he meant that if you ain't first, you're last. And to you know, force his, uh, his metaphor a little bit, I think that this is a market where quality is going to be everything. And I think that people who have good properties are going to come out of this pretty well. And I think that people who have anything other than good properties are really going to take a beating. Uh, I guess that's that's my sense of, of how this is going to work out, that there is going to be a, a severe haves and haves not division uh, in a lot of areas of real estate. Well, and that segues into uh, the next slide, which uh, we, we talk about survival of the fittest. And so that was pretty apropos on your part, Mr. Watson. But, <laughs> Happy to help. <laughs> but, but I, I you know, we, we could recap survival of the fittest and call it preservation of liquidity uh, because the companies and, you know, I, I, I look at the major airlines as being a really good, a very good example of that. They've, they've done a pretty good job of preserving liquidity. And we talked a little bit about this earlier in the, the discussion as it related to the middle market and the service providers to these industries, the hotel chains, the airlines and so forth. You know, that's where I would, would think, and I'd like to get your thoughts as well, guys, uh, where there, there's value. Because going into this uh, pandemic, I, I think that from a preservation of liquidity perspective, uh, when you look at the service providers to these industries, they likely did not preserve liquidity as well. And while these companies may have really good loans, they, uh, they're hurting right now. Um, and the question is, well, how long can they uh, continue? We've talked about cheap money. We've talked about the PPP money being made available. Inevitably, these companies, which are impacted now, will continually uh, to be, continue to be impacted. And it's good, I'm curious to see um, how uh, distressed investors are going to be looking at these particular companies to, uh, to, to prop up uh, these survivors, if you will, if, if, if that's possible. You guys have any thoughts on that? And we talked again a little bit about this earlier, but I'd like to uh, focus a little bit more if we could. I think people, I think people are, you know, making decisions of where to put their money. Um, you know, we've got a, a, a large credit fund who, when you talk to them, 75, 80% of their portfolio is great. And 20% of their portfolio is horrendous. Um, they ended up, you know, basically getting the keys in non-bankruptcy transactions on a bowling alley franchise, a, uh, a, a health club franchise, and um, a trampoline, you know, company um, this year. Um, and what do they, you know, what do they do with it? Well, they've doubled down on the health club, which I thought was, which is really interesting. Um, they're trying to, you know just lead their way through the other two thinking that they will come back. But I think in the trampoline park, they have four out of 40 
locations open, the bowling alleys, they have one location in the whole country open. So what do you do? Um, but if you can hold on long enough and remember they were the lender and now they're the equity holder, um, you know, they think the other side will, will, will be good. And clearly that's where they, you know, hope to get their, their money. Up. So I think this is a place for another one of those truisms that we hear about COVID, uh, which is that it's not really a change agent so much as an accelerant. And I think the challenge for people is trying to figure out which, which industries are going to come back uh, to something like the way they were and which industries were challenged in a way that, uh, you know, a big part of it won't come back. The one example of that that leaps out at me is I think that the, the Airbnb folks have done a nice job of disrupting the hotel industry and changing the demand for that industry um, in a way that, you know, nobody has really disturbed the commercial uh, airline industry yet. So just as a, as a hypothetical, do you feel better about getting back into the airline supply chain than you do investing in a small, uh, smaller uh, hospitality uh, chain? I think that's, this is ultimately why entrepreneurs make a lot of money is that somebody's going to have to decide the answer to these questions and somebody's going to decide right. And it will have been very brave and foresighted to have made that decision. Well, and that's, that's the fascinating play in, in distressed m and uh, you hit that right on the head because, you know, you think about the opportunities that are out there and for these pro professional distressed investors, there may not be as much competition in some of these industries, particularly the health clubs and the, and the plays that, that may be done um, in, that, in that scope. But um, that's what, how this whole thing is going to shake out. I think it's fascinating to, to see how, um, how ones are going to pivot from uh, the opportunities that are presenting themselves and taking, you know, the, the health club uh, focus and turning it into something that obviously can be something profitable. That's where these, again, these, these entrepreneurs and these, these professional M&A experts are going to come in and really uh, uh, make a run at something that otherwise um, many others would, would not be uh, focused on considering. Jim, did you have a comment or are we going to move on? I think I, I think I think you can you can move on. I think the other thing that, that just to sort of to talk about just a little bit is um, is how much how much has been transacted in 20 and 21 um, not in the bankruptcy arena where you know there's been Article Nines or there's been ABCs or there's people just buying bank debt. Um, you know those type of things, and I can I think that's what you're going to continue to continue to see um, in um, in 21, which is how to find alternatives to bankruptcy, which is you know which is really expensive. Um, the one thing I think we haven't touched on at all, Scott, and it's not in the slides, is you know subchapter five, and is subchapter five here to stay, and and what happens. Um, in subchapter five, and what are the you know in in the in the lower middle market, um, how much opportunity does that get to people to really cleanse things and do a 363 sale um, through an Article Five, which is you know basically a bankruptcy with you know less than seven and a half million dollars of of debt. And there's you know there's been a lot of creative things done um, by lawyers, um, right or wrong to try to address what what seven and a half million dollars worth of debt is. Um, and I think, you know, that that will continue to play um, if it gets extended, uh, which I think everybody expects it in, in, you know, in the new CARES Act legislation. No, that's a very good point. And in the lower middle market, certainly that's going to be a vehicle that, that can certainly be utilized as well as uh, the ability to extend the runway out on assuming and rejecting uh, Executory contracts and our expired leases. I mean, that's been uh, uh, talked about as well uh, in terms of, of expanding again that runway. The uh, preference exposure has been lessened with regard to arrears, rental arrears, and so forth. So, those are important points that um, uh, allow for companies to navigate through this. And Subchapter 5, again, is a good example of that. Why don't we move to the next slide as we uh, hit into what I, what I consider to be um, certainly another crossroads for retail. And uh, I, I, I'm so taken aback, taken by this, this quote by Les Wexner, 
um, that he made uh, must have been around April or May of last year. Uh, and, you know, you think about history being on his side with regard to retail. Yes, he's correct. It certainly is. But there was no Amazon and there wasn't an ability to uh, to shop by using one's fingertip like it is today. And as we as we move on and, and look at retail and the options that are available, um, I think that it's it's important to consider what malls are going to look like um, and how things are going to proceed um, post pandemic. And we can move to the next slide. Um, we talked a little bit about the, the business models that are out there, you know, relating to um, um, the malls and um, uh, what's next for retail. Um, we talked a little bit about the health clubs and the, uh, the other large retail stores and big boxes and so forth um, that are that are in malls and how it's been impacted by the uh, by the pandemic. Certainly going to be interesting to see what is the next pivot on the part of these mall owners because we know that retail is in a, in a very tough spot. Um, the idea of taking a big box and making it a health club or an arcade or a movie theater has already become a thing of the past and this was something that was uh, introduced you know, not so long ago, uh, probably in the last half decade. So it's pretty remarkable how quickly things have, have changed. And the question now is going to be, uh, and it's been written about, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, guys, but the scaling down of retail in malls and then creating fulfillment centers all part of one's mall. Uh, so essentially you do your shopping on one side and you pick up on the other. Um, I, you know, we're hearing that a lot of, of mall operators are giving that a lot of thought as they are, again, pivoting away from um, the initial model that they thought would, uh, would garner good profitability. Um, we know that malls are, are being um, uh, obviously really destroyed by, by the pandemic, and we have seen numerous strategies that have come into play. Uh, the reorganizations of retail, for example, as it relates to J. Crew and uh, J.C. Penney's reorganization and subsequent sale. I'm just curious, and I want to get your thoughts, guys, on what you foresee reta retail looking like in a post-pandemic world, given everything that uh, that we are seeing and the efforts that are going to be made to try and get foot traffic back into these centers. Yeah, you know, we, it, it's interesting. We had a client uh, last year uh, that was a retail chain that had basically about a 20,000 square, anywhere from 15 to 20,000 square uh, square foot footprint in each location, um, which made uh, the negotiations with most landlords um, pretty easy because they weren't getting movie theaters. <laughs> they weren't getting gyms. I mean, there, there was nobody else to really come in and, and rent this. And then we had issues with a few of the, of the major landlords who were redoing the centers into lifestyle centers. So, so multi-use, um, you know, residential slash, you know, trying to, you know, some healthcare, um, you know, those type of things that they had five-year plans for that they cared about us, but they didn't care about us. Uh, and then there was other people that wanted to move us to other parts of the, the, the mall or to the perimeter and, and, and things like that. So, um, you know, it's a reckoning for, for, for malls and it has been for a while. And, and all this has done is um, make them rethink it in the ways that, that Scott talked about but just means that they've got to speed up the process of how they're doing it forever. You know, Brookfield and Simon can't go out and buy every retailer in the country um, just so they keep their malls filled. Um, they need to do it to a certain extent, but they, you know, they don't have, you know, they're not the federal government and can write unlimited checks. <laughs> Scott, I have a whole lot of reactions to your question. If maybe to start with something that uh, you didn't, you didn't start with. I do think that one of the things I've seen every time there's been a cycle of distress is that the asset owners and the asset lenders get better at getting the assets in the right place more cheaply. Um, and and the, the trend away from the full scale multi-year expensive bankruptcy toward other, other ways of getting where you need to go 
I think we're going to see even more of than we saw 10 years ago. And, you know, two or three times as much of as we did 20 years ago. So I think that's that's uh, that's something that's going to be part of this equation. Uh, more generally, this is why I guess I think entrepreneurs make their money. To my way of thinking, the the retail landscape has been fundamentally altered by people getting in the habit of getting things that aren't very interesting delivered to their house. Uh, I don't think you go shopping for the joy of it just to buy um, toothpaste, but I do think people find uh, other kinds of shopping to be a social activity. And I do think that, um, that the people search for community is an important part of what's going on more generally in the country. If, you know, to put together a whole bunch of dissonant things, uh, if anybody goes to CrossFit, you'll notice that that's a big part of what they're selling is that you're you're part of a group or uh, a lot that we read about affiliations with political parties that people are trying to find a place to fit in. I think uh, real estate owners who find a way to have their place offer some kind of sense of community um, are going to be people who are successful and people who just want to offer cheap space are going to be more challenged. I guess that's my perspective. And, you know, David, one of the things that you mentioned were, uh, was something that I did want to touch on, and that is alternatives, alternatives to restructurings. Um, you know, we have seen, obviously, in 2020, there were more restructurings than there were in 2019. I don't know whether we're going to see uh, uh, an uptick in restructurings in 21 versus 2020, I do think that there are alternatives. Uh, there are alternatives to bankruptcy that are out there. Jim had mentioned uh, the serve core assignment for the benefit of creditors as being one of them. He also mentioned secured party sales and, uh, and, and the like. I think that uh, there's, there is a strong likelihood that we're going to see uh, those alternatives to bankruptcy because perhaps bankruptcy is in fact cost prohibitive for, an, uh, for a number of, of different circumstances. And, Jim, I, I guess that allows me to, to ask you if you wanted to just touch briefly on assignments for the benefit of creditors, because um, particularly on the retail side, if there are liquidations in the right circumstance, an assignment for the benefit of creditors is something that could be considered, as well as as well as the other alternatives um, that, that that should be con should be put on the table and for a board to ultimately consider. Yeah, I mean, in in ABC is a um, is is a great alternative um, in you know a liquidation or a quick uh, quasi 363 sale, um, you know where it can be done cheaper, faster, better. Um, you get to pick your fiduciary. I think you know um, private equity firms and venture capitalists really like this um, because they sort of know what the you know the, the, they're picking the the, the outcome. And they're also picking the fiduciary um, to make sure that it, there's sort of no wild cards out of uh, a um, out of a Chapter Seven bankruptcy. I, I have heard, you know, um, horror story after horror story in the last month or two about, um, you know, Chapter Seven trustees getting involved in things, and um, you know where Wells Fargo was owed, you know, twenty five million dollars, and they ended up getting. Uh, you know, they had offers on the table at 15 to 20, but the chapter seven trustee took, you know, three months to get it done and they end up with seven or, or you know, or $9 million from it. Those are the things that you're trying to stay away from um, and something that it, that it, uh, in ABC really, really helps. David, go ahead. I saw you light up there. Well, I, as much as anything, I wanted to ask my fellow panelists a question, which was, or maybe both of you a question, which was, to what degree do you think that the, what seems to me to be more complex capital structures uh, that we have for some of these assets going to make it harder to use the simpler and cheaper methods that, that uh, Jim and I have just gotten through speculating will be popular? I, I, I'll, I'll go just from an assignee. I think, David, that, that was always the issue, which is if you had a, 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 tr a really complicated cap structure um, where you, you, know, you had an agent and, and 
you know, and, and there was multiple banks involved. Were you ever going to be able to get through, an, you know, through an alternative to bankruptcy? I think that is still um, a real issue that, that that's out there. I think what, you know, and I think this goes back to where we, we talked about where it's a real, really advantageous is um, the alternatives to banks. So the credit funds, the BDCs of the world. Um, who, you know, it, there might be one or two secured lenders that are involved that makes sense. And I think those are the people that have really um, gone out of their way, um, you know, to try to figure out alternatives to bankruptcy. I, it, it's not going to work when you've got, you know, a, a syndicated loan structure and you've got, you know, seven participating banks. There's no question that, it, that in order for, for an alternative to a bankruptcy to work, uh, it's got to be the right structure. Um, and, and simply put, the more complicated the structure, the less likely uh, an alternative to a bankruptcy is, is going to work. Um, I think that's the, that's the beauty of, 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 of the bankruptcy code, that we have you know, set laws in place and a code to follow, and that when we have complexities, we can lean on that code to guide us through that. Um, with regard to uh, state-oriented statutes with, uh, as it relates to uh, assignments for the benefit of creditors, um, you know, it's, it's, it's simplified. Uh, it does not contemplate uh, many of the things that, that are contemplated in the bankruptcy code. And for that reason, again, the complexities of your set circumstance, it's good. You're going to have to evaluate individual individual circumstance by circumstance and determining whether an alternative ultimately works. That, that seems right to me. I uh, just was curious to hear your experience in that area. Sure. What I what I would say as we as we begin to close things down in our in our discussion relating to uh, 2021 and expectations and M&A, I think that and I'd like to get your final takeaways before we open it up to the group for any questions that we may have. I'd like to get your final takeaways as, and you guys have pretty much forecasted throughout, but just an overall expectation um, in 21 and beyond from an activity standpoint and, and what we in, uh, should expect to see uh, in the very near future. I guess my instinct, if I'm going to go first, is that uh... The first half of this year is going to be not inactive, but relatively slow. And it will be people doing what they cannot avoid doing in an effort to hold on until the end of the pandemic. And I guess I'm hopeful that uh, sometime in the middle of the year, that's going to become clearly, uh, you know, more or less managed. And then I think actually the second half of the year, oddly, will be uh, characterized by a lot more distressed M and A that we saw than we saw last year, because once um, the creditors see that they won't wind up owning the asset or won't wind up having to take a tremendous loss, they're going to be much more willing to force their their credits to take action. And I think once borrower, once uh, all of the dry powder can actually see an economy that would support operating the businesses for sale, they'll be more willing to pay up. And I think those lines cross and you see a lot of transactions taking place to resolve, you know, troubled uh, credits. I think oddly, um, there won't be as much healthy M&A at the, uh, at this, in the second half of 21 as there was in the second half of 20. I guess that's just my instinct. Hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what I was going to say, I think from from restructuring professionals, because I do agree with David sort of on what his premise was, is that I think that people, especially in the first quarter, are trying to figure out when is this going to be over? What what is the what is the, the, the new world look like? Um, but I think from a restructuring professional, both from financial advisory and, and from 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 lawyers, um, I think there's going to be a lot of work um, in the first half of the year because people have got to come up with their proposals to their bank, um, their proposals to their board about whether there's going to be fresh capital put in, um, you know, how do, how do we go attack the credit markets? Because they've got to come up with what they think the new normal is and be able to, you know, write that 13 week cash flow, write that, 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 that 2021 business plan. 
um, to go forward and they're going to be reaching out um, to restructuring professionals to help them and to plan for the best and the worst case. Very good. Uh, I, I think we're on the precipice, obviously, of, of just a, a windfall of activity. Um, you know, I, I think that there was the expectation that we were going to see it um, a great deal of it in, in 2020. Uh, we saw some of it, but it not. But the uh, the floodgates did not open. I think everyone can can acknowledge that the floodgates did not open at the levels that we all had anticipated. And I think that once uh, once things clear up, once presumably the uh, the government stimulus comes to an end, um, I think at that point you're going to see a, a slew of activity that's going to probably keep us busy uh, for the next three, five, and maybe even longer years. Um, that that essentially brings us. So, oh, David, I'm sorry. Did you have a comment? No, no I'm, I'm, see, I'm seeing the lights. This is the beauty of, of the interactive. <laughs> I see the blue light comes on, and it's like, okay, you know, let let David speak. Okay. Um, so this is yeah, this is the the interactive world that we all live in now. Um, hopefully, the next time we can can convene with one another, it'll be uh, without masks and and in person, right? Um, that would be to be hoped for. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that means we'll all be busy because uh, people will be able to make their market clearing transactions. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, we, we this does bring us to the to the end of our discussion, and I wanted just to throw out a couple of, of housekeeping matters. Um, we are hoping uh, to have another one of these uh, chats uh, to see how we're how we forecasted things uh, in our first iteration of of, uh, of these uh, of these chats. We're hoping to have another discussion, probably. Uh, I would think the end of the second quarter, uh, sort of a midway point. And we certainly look forward to having everyone who was on today's call uh, joining us then. Um, at, at this time, uh, the chat room uh, is open. And if anyone has any questions or any points that they would like to raise, we certainly uh, have the, uh, the wherewithal to allow you to do that. So uh, let's just take a couple of moments to see if anyone has questions or wants to post anything in the chat room. Uh, and, uh, and, and we'll pivot accordingly. Nothing like dead air, right? Um, what what I would what I would say um, when you know you look back at. Um, 2020 and and just the really amazing ride that it was. Um, and I, I, this is what we call filler in the broadcast profession, guys. But but when you look at at, at 2020, to think where we were in March with everything being shut down, and then uh, things coming back the way they did with these deals that were put off, and I it just seeming I I, I distinctly recall uh, getting getting calls on deals that were pushing forward in January and February and then March hit and then the, the deals came to an abrupt end. And the, the calls that we, we received from, uh, from clients were more focused on, are we gonna trip any covenants if we're drawing down on our line so that we can preserve liquidity? Those calls came from numerous boards and uh, I just thought it was very fascinating, um, a very fascinating time to work through. Any additional th uh, thoughts? Matt, do we have any questions in the chat room at this time? We do not. Okay. Well, then I guess we're going to end four minutes early uh, with, with no other questions. Uh, again, thank you very much to everyone who joined us. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you again, uh, hopefully. And we'll, we'll certainly send out a date as to the next chat that we, that we do have. But again, we anticipate having it um, uh, in the second quarter, probably toward the toward the tail end. So thanks again. Uh, have a good rest of the afternoon and uh, stay healthy. Thank you, everybody. Okay, bye Scott. Now. Thank you for inviting me. Our pleasure, Jim. Thanks.